mess that up. <laughs> Peace be with you. That's the message for this morning in Isaiah 6, 1 through 6. Peace be with you. I got this at Hobby Lobby 50% off. Hallelujah. Amen. I know that the Lord did this. He planned it. And his purpose was for my son to work at Hobby Lobby so I could get this for 50% off. There's a sale going on at Hobby Lobby. No, I'm sorry. I'm trying to help out. I thought it was kind of unique and kind of cool that I would, as I was preparing for the Advent season and praying and seeking God's wisdom and guidance, that we found this. Can I share Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 6 with you? Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations by the way of the sea beyond Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice in the harvest, as warriors rejoice when divided the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, a rod of their oppressors. oppressors. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. But, but, for unto us, a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Amen. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Funny how that is. <laughs> the United States may not be found in Scripture, but Christmas is. Amen. <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> I believe, y'all, I believe that indeed Christmas is found in the Scriptures. I believe that although it may not be as we think, I believe that in these Scriptures there is cause and ground for joy and rejoicing. Don't you? Yes. I love Christmas, y'all. I need to. I better. My wife starts January the 1st getting ready for Christmas. Did y'all know it's three days of Christmas? About 270 days ago, she bought a chalkboard. Are y'all hearing me? Around seven months ago, she bought a chalkboard. And every morning, I go to the kitchen and she marks down from that chalkboard. There's about 260 days of Christmas. Yay! 259. 258. I walk in there every day and I'm like, oh, come on. Come on. And yet, she, she, she walks in there. She doesn't walk, she skips as best she can. And with a smile on her face, she wipes that number off. One, another one bites the dust. Boom. <laughs> and so she gets ready, man. I mean, her pump is prime, and she is ready for Christmas. You know what I'm saying? It's not because of what she gets. Do you know the gift that she gets for Christmas? It's given. Amen. By her giving to others, and their response when they receive that gift. It's not about money, y'all. The gift that we give may not be much monetarily. But it's the fact that somebody... Do you know joy is contagious? Do you know that? Do you know that a smile and joy is contagious? It impacts people in ways you can't fathom. My grandmother would say, Boy, a smile and a kind word doesn't cost you anything. Be generous in giving it out. And so I have tried as best I'm able to to walk with a smile on my face and a kind word on my lips if, if I can. Because it changes people's lives. But it ought not be held back for Christmas, y'all. We ought to be celebrating Christmas every day, shouldn't we? We ought to be celebrating Easter every day, shouldn't we? Because it, it's not seasonal. The love of God is not seasonal. The grace and mercy of God is not just found on Christmas morning. The love and grace of God, the hope and peace offered by God is given to us graciously and generously, able to be manifested every day of our lives. Is that not reason to cause a celebration? Amen. Oh, come on now, y'all. I've got four kids. Do you know the joy of those four kids? Going and finding their presence and shaking them. You know what I'm saying? I messed one of them up because I got sick of it. 
She walked in there. She said, I know what I got for Christmas. Said, no, you don't. And you know she did? Sneaky thing she was. She, she learned how to steam open that tape. And she'd pee and she'd stick it back. I didn't know. She'd walk in there. She had a prophet. She'd walk in there. She said, that's a whatever, that's a whatever, that's a whatever, that's a whatever. She's freaking me out, man. You know what I'm <laughs> so I tell you what I did. I told Patty, I'm going to fix her wagon. I went to Sam's and I bought the biggest thing of ketchup I could. You know what I'm saying? I wrapped that thing up in duct tape. I put that thing in a box, in a box, in a box, in a box. You know what I'm saying? That thing weighed about 70 pounds. She had absolutely no idea what it was. And so on Christmas morning, because she couldn't get into it, I made sure she could not duct tape that thing. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I wrapped that thing up so you'd have to use explosive to get to it. So on, on, on Christmas morning, she had no idea. And she was overwhelmed because she judged what I was going to give her by the weight of that package. You know what I'm saying? And so when she finally cut through and got to us, you should have seen the look on my face, not just her. <laughs> <laughs> so I received, a, I received a, a gift that day. I was able to give her something she didn't want, and I got a lot of joy out of that. <laughs> I love Christmas. But Christmas is not just about gifts, though it is the greatest gift. We spoke of that, right? That Jesus Christ is the gift of eternity to his flesh-born children. That God, before he ever made us, gifted us with salvation in eternity past. So that when God made us and God created us, God knew we failed. He knew that we would fail. And that in his failure, salvation is not a backup plan. It's not an emergency plan. It's a foregone conclusion based on God's love and foreknowledge that we would, he did. And in that gift, before he ever made us, in that gift come Christmas morning... When that baby in swaddling clothes was unwrapped, he was unwrapped based on prophecy, based on promise, based on hope, based on love, based on grace, based on mercy. Amen? I don't know about y'all, but if I can unpack under my tree this Christmas love, grace, and mercy, I think I've done pretty good. Amen. If I can unpack under the Christmas tree this morning peace and promise and provisions, and power, I think I've done really good. And God offers us that. It's not unlike, if you would, Nancy is a four-year-old child. <coughs> and Nancy being only about four years old, she has not completely clued into what Christmas is. So her mama and her daddy and her nene and her papa and, and her sisters and bubbas, all of them are trying to help Nancy out. And they're trying to explain to her what Christmas is all about. And they bring Jesus into the fix. <laughs> and they tell them that Christmas is about Jesus. It's about Mary and, and Joseph and the baby Jesus. And because of that, because of the gift of Jesus on Christmas morning, a long, long time ago, that's why we give gifts today. And so after Christmas morning, when Nancy had opened up all of her presents, she's only four years old. Later that day, she was heard by her mother remarking to her older siblings, I sure hope Mary and Joseph have another baby next Christmas, don't you? <laughs> Amen. Amen. As we look into the Word today, I, I want to share with you a this thought. Peace be with you. Is that not the universal need? I don't want to be politically incorrect, so I'm trying not to be. But you would have to be a rip bam wrinkle and plum dumb or oblivious not to have figured out by now we live in one messed up world. Amen. Amen. It's not about Democrats or Republicans or independents. It's about human beings being in the human beings. Isn't it? It used to be that I could have a civil discourse with anybody about anything. That's no longer true. Now I'm a hater. Now I'm intolerant. Now I'm politically incorrect. Now I'm one of them. I hate that stuff. I do too. I hate that stuff. The devil is the one behind all this. Do you hear me? Because I am old enough, and some of you y'all are as old as I am, and y'all remember that we've been through hard times, y'all. We've been through some bad, bad days. But it was never this bad when civil discourse was almost unheard of because now people are taking sides and throwing rocks at each other if you have a disagreement. That is not right. And that kind of stuff has no business in God's church. Do you hear me? Right. No business at all. In this place, there ought to be peace. Amen. 
in this place above all places, people should be able to come in here and find and feel and sense peace and harmony and unity. Should we not? Amen. 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 And so the universal need manifested and demonstrated in the world around us is peace. Do you realize that our nation is spending billions and hundreds of billions of dollars a year pursuing what? Peace. It ain't harmony, it's peace. They want to build a city in California for the homeless. And they want us to pay for us because they want to make peace. They want to do all kinds of crazy stuff in the name of peace. Who's peace? Y'all help me. Who, who's peace? Who's going to be at peace? If you spend my money, you're, I'm not going to be at peace. If I spend your money, if I take away your money to make me happy, you're going to be at peace with me? No. <laughs> And so all over the world we see this junk. We see it in the name of religion. And we use that religion to beat each other up. And we claim and we bring God to the midst. And yet all through human history, the overwhelming, overarching theme of all civilizations through all the march of time is that the things that we do, we do for peace. We conquer other lands in the name of peace. We beat people up in the name of peace. We get prejudice and we get racially insane. All that kind of junk. And we do it in the name of what? Peace? Y'all help me. If we don't have peace with God, and we don't have peace with each other, and we don't have peace with ourselves, there will be no peace. Amen. 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 And so all those billions have been spent, lives have been lost, and the journey continues. The, there is no peace to be found. That's what the scripture said. Isaiah the prophet also uh, shared. There can be no peace without God and God's peace. There can be no peace to the wicked. There can be no peace to the evil ones. There can be no peace to those that disobey God. There can be no peace to those that distance themselves from God's love and God's grace. There can be no peace. If peace is to be <coughs> defined as a state of mind where one can have harmony with God, ourselves, and others, if that's the definition, which I think is a pretty good definition, what are we finding? What are we finding? Well, I'm not mistaken, it, it, it happened a long, long time ago. It happened in a state. And it happened in fulfillment to a prophecy and a promise. All through human history, there has been this promise made by God the Father, proclaimed by God's men and women. And that promise was this. One day, one day, a Savior will be born. One day, a King, the King of Heaven, will leave Heaven and come to this earth. He'll be born by a virgin, and He'll be born in poverty, and He'll make His, he'll make his life and His way among His own creation. He'll be humiliated, He'll be shamed, He'll be disrespected, He'll be humiliated, He'll be taken, broken, and murdered by those of his own creation. Yet in his death, we'll find life. In his agony, we'll find liberty. And in his suffering, we'll find peace. And so when Isaiah looked at the corridor of time, looking back to the garden, looking far to a place called Calvary, he said, unto us a son has been born. And upon his shoulders there shall be the government of God. And he'll be called Wonderful and Counselor of the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. And above all names, above all names, is the Prince of Peace. It seems kind of ironic in a way, doesn't it? That the three guys from the West, from the East, those three ambassadors, representatives of a foreign nation, really alienated and separated from the rest of the world by their own choice and choosing, that three of them would come on this lengthy journey, on this arduous uh, journey. They'd make their way to a place in Nazareth. They'd make their way to a home in Nazareth. They would bend their knee and bow their head and offer gifts to whom? A baby? <laughs> no, they didn't offer their gifts to a baby. He was a baby. But they didn't see a baby. What they saw was the King of Kings. What they saw was the Lord of Lords. What they saw was the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, the first, the last, the Almighty. What they give, what they gave, they didn't give gifts to a baby. 
They gave, they gave their gifts to the Prince of Peace. They gave their gifts to the King of Kings because they realized that in this child was the possibility of peace. That in this child was the possibility that there could be the end of the eternal conflict. That in this child there could be peace and there could be promise. And so as, as Christ came and lived among us and died for us, his prophets still proclaim this, this message. Have you heard them? Romans 5 1 says this. Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord and Christ, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 2 14 says, He is our peace. Colossians 1 and 20 says, Having then made peace through the blood of the cross, He reconciles all things into Himself. Into himself. The question might be then, how do we get peace? Is it automatic? Am I guaranteed peace because I've been baptized? Am I guaranteed peace because I claim the name of Jesus? Am I guaranteed peace because I come to church? Am I guaranteed peace because I pray? Am I guaranteed peace because I read the Bible? Am I guaranteed peace because I give in the offer? Am I guaranteed peace? No. I'm not guaranteed peace any more than I'm guaranteed love. I'm not guaranteed peace any more than I'm guaranteed my next heartbeat and my next breath. Every gift that God gives to from, from above. Is that what the Bible says? And the gift of peace also comes from above and comes from within. If I, if I realize what God did, how He manifested His great love, how He demonstrated His great love, and His sacrificial offering of His Son, His only Son at Calvary, for you, for me, for us, and for others. When I understand that and I accept it, then I have a foundation. Then I have at least a fighting chance to know peace in my life. Can I help you? I have. I did not know peace until I knew Jesus. Amen. 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 I didn't know peace. We have said before, and I don't want to run this thing to the pitch, but I need you to hear me. I know what I am to you. Y'all help me. Do you know who you are? Yes. Come on. Do you know what you've done? Do you? Do you know those? Can you name the ones you've hurt? Can you? Can you name the things you've done wrong? Can you? Every one of us knows who we are. And every one of us knows where we've been. And every one of us knows what we've done, who we've done it to, and what we did to them. Every one of us does. And because of those things in our lives, for the most part, we don't know, nor can we have peace. Temporarily, we can. You know why? We go. We spend millions and, and, and billions of dollars for therapy, don't we? Do you know why people go to therapy? P e a c e. Amen. Y'all help me. If you don't want peace, you don't need a therapist. But you go to a therapist because you're miserable, don't you? You go to a therapist because something inside of you is guilt-ridden and shame-filled, and you want relief. And you want something internally to happen so you can know peace. So you can have peace. And these gifted people, bless them, they sit and they listen as we share with them our hurts and our pains. And as much as they might want to, as desperately as we need them to, they can't give us peace. Drugs can't give us peace. Alcohol can't give us peace. Money can't give us peace. The government can't give us peace. Nobody can give us peace other than the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. Amen. And when we come to the point of desperation, if you want to call it that, and we've tried everything else and it's failed us, and we come to the cross called Calvary, and we come to the hill called Gadot, and we look up at a piece of rustic timber where hangs and suffering and shame, a Savior whose name is Jesus, Emmanuel, God who dwells with and among us, when we look and we see His suffering, and we experience at least in part His shame, and we come to the realization of our need, and we accept the promise and provision that He offers, and we say to Him, God, save me, please. And He does. My brothers and my sisters, can I tell you, you can know peace. Amen. Now, I'm speaking straight up. I don't even remember now. It's back in 1979, 1980. I don't remember. But when I went to Liberty Baptist Church 
and Brother John King in his flip flops, his t shirt, and a Thompson chain Bible. <laughs> On the front pew of that old missionary Baptist church, when he laid open the Roman road and he said, Brother, you need Jesus. My daddy's a preacher. I don't care who your daddy is. You need Jesus. Well, I go to church. It ain't about church. It's not about the pedigree. not about baptism. not about... It ain't about that. You need Jesus. <coughs> and in my stumbling, halting, shameful way, I said, Lord, if the Brother John tells me you can save me, I sure need somebody to. And I hope you will. Amen. <laughs> You know he did it? Do you hear me? He did it. Yes. Do you know what happened that night? I slept all night long. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? I didn't have nightmares. I didn't have all that stuff in my past waking me up at night. I didn't have that anymore. For the first time in many, many, many years, I slept all night long. Do you know why? Do you know why? I have found peace. Amen. Because now I know the Prince of Peace, and his name is Jesus. I offer that to you. If you have him, you ought to tell somebody. If you know him, you ought to indeed share that with others. It may be today that you and I and us and others are like this story. After the Civil War had ended, there was a an officer, I don't remember his name. He was traveling back out over the fields of one of the, the battles, one of the great battles around Chattanooga, Tennessee. And as he went across that battlefield, remembering the battle and the agony and all that took place, he went further and further back into the woods. And back in the woods, way back deep in the woods, out around Chattanooga, Tennessee, out around Lookout Mountain, he stumbled across a cabin. And in this cabin, it's surrounded by, by several acres of field and, and, and tilled field. And as he walked into the door, they shouted out a greeting to those inside. They wouldn't open the door. And after a while of, of, of pleading with them and, and talking to them through the door, they cracked the door, and one person stumbled out to the daylight. And he asked, he says, who are you with? You a Yankee? <laughs> are you with Mr. Lee? He said, well, I was with the Confederacy. Why? He said, well, Kevin, come on in, brother. When he came in and sat down, he realized that there was three Confederate soldiers who had left the battlefield several years ago, and they had been living out in this cottage in the woods at a field. They didn't have a telegram, they didn't have a newspaper, they didn't meet with anybody. And so as he spoke to them, they asked him a question, who won? Who won? He said, man, peace was, peace was achieved years ago. And when he told them that peace had been made years ago, that they could go home if they chose to, they started crying. Because they realized the wasted years. They realized the wasted fears. They realized that because they were afraid and full of fear and had no peace and didn't know about peace, they had been hiding and they had no reason to. And so the man who went to them was the bearer of good, good news. And the one that went to them shared with them the message of peace. And when he left, he took two with him. And they were reunited with their families, which was again a cause of rejoicing. Do you know sometimes many of us are traveling through this dusty, lonely landscape called life, and we've not received, we've not heard, We've not accepted the message of peace because we've not accepted the Prince of Peace. Might I offer to you this Christmas a present? <laughs> May it be that you unwrap this year Jesus. Amen. 
May it be that when you and Rev. Jesus are accept and receive Jesus, may it be that under your tree this year or wherever it is you open your gifts, may God give you peace. May God give you forgiveness. May God give you strength. May God give you healing. May God give you grace. May God give you mercy. May God give you love. May God give you whatever it is you're seeking for, longing for, and need. Amen? Amen. And amen. So as we stand and we sing together, closing hymn of response.